My dear friends, I'm Bishop Boudreaux, and I'm glad once again to welcome you to our program on this station, which we call uh, A Lord Among Us. Each week, I appear on television. We talk about our relationship with God, with our neighbor, with the earth about us. And uh, it, it perhaps uh, we'll get some new motivation in the practice of our faith. Last week, we spoke about the priesthood. And when we spoke of the priesthood, I meant primarily the man you see at the altar saying mass, or the man in the confessional, or the man whom you call to anoint the sick. But I'm going to talk today about a rather mysterious thing. I'm going to talk about three priesthoods that are one, and one priesthood that is three. But until we have the opening hymn, I'll leave you wondering what I'm going to talk about. And our hymn today is, as is often the case, today we're going to hear from the St. Lucy's Choir of Huma, Louisiana. Then I will be back. My dear friends, I'm back and with gratitude to our choir for their presence on our program. 
I'll try to unravel the mystery that I proposed, which is not really a mystery, but I just put it that way, of the three priesthoods in one, one priesthood in three. Actually, if you want to put it one way, there's only one priesthood in the church. That's the priesthood of Jesus Christ. But there are three methods or manners or degrees of that priesthood by the will of God himself. The first is the order of bishops. Go back to the early church, go back to the scriptures, we find that Jesus ordained the first 12, they were the apostles, they were the bishops. We find in the Acts of the Apostles that they continued uh, handing down this authority to others by the imposition of hands. The two we are sure about are Timothy and Titus. He pointed that out last week, and St. Paul said to them, Stir up the grace of God within you, which you have received, he said, through the imposition of my hand, and tend the flock in your, chair, in your care, over whom the Holy Spirit has set you to rule the church of God. So that's the first order of priesthood. Now it's the same priesthood of Jesus Christ, because Jesus breathed upon them, gave them power to forgive sins, told them to do this in memory of me, which means the repetition of the Eucharistic celebration, etc., etc. We talked about this last week. So that's the order of the bishops. Then the, in turn, St. Paul directed Titus and Timothy to ordain priests in every city. So you have the first order of priesthood, which is the highest order. That's the office of the bishop. You have the second order, which is the order of the priesthood. Men are ordained priests by the bishop to assist him in the care of the territory over which he has charge. So they have the one, the priesthood of the bishop. Secondly, the priesthood of the, of the priest. I won't call him the ordinary priest. There's no such thing. Of the man we see at the altar. And then there's the priesthood of the laity. Now, each has a different function and a different degree. When we speak of the priesthood of the laity, we recall the words of St. Peter when he said to the, his, the people to whom he preached, he said, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart. Now, what does this mean practically? Well, we get the first glimpse of what it means if you study the history of the early church in this manner particularly. When a Gentile or a, or a Jew was converted to the new religion, the Christianity, so to speak, they had to be instructed. In addition to the individual instruction or the group instruction which they had, they'd attend in the Mass, what we call the Mass today, the first part, which was to the liturgy of the Word, or the preaching. But after they heard the preaching, which was the Gospel, before the Gospel was even written at the beginning, and the epistles before they were even written, in fact, the written, the written accounts of the Gospels are merely putting down what was orally preached by the apostles and the priest. But once the catechumens, as they were called, that is, those who were being received into the church, had heard the sermon, or the homily, as we call it today, they had to leave. They were not allowed to take part in the Eucharistic liturgy because they were not yet baptized. They were not yet part of God's people. They were not yet free from original sin. They were not part of the unity of the body of Christ which came through baptism and later through confirmation. So you have the order of the, of the bishop, the first order, the order of the second order of priesthood, which is the man you see at the altar in your parish, your, the man who is your confession, etc. Then you have the priest of the laity. Today, I won't emphasize, and I wish someone else would do this, but I have to tell you the truth. That the, what, what is the theology of the church on the bishop? Well, as a bishop, let me tell you, it's very frightening to tell you the truth. Um, let's begin this way. In order to clarify the role of the bishop for our time, the Second Vatican Council discussed the entire issue of what a bishop was and what he was supposed to do and what he was supposed to be. Now let me read what some of the early fathers of the church said. What was the belief and, and the, the, the faith of the early community, the first, say, 
50 or 75 or 100 or 100 or 200 years. How did they see the bishop? How did they understand his role? Let me read you some of their words. The earliest writers of the church, men like Tertullian, St. Ignatius of Antioch, these were men who knew the apostles, were very strong with the theology as the true theology of the church that the bishop was the ruling priesthood of the church. Chief place, I, we, we, I quote one of them, chief place in the church belongs to the office of those appointed to the bishopric. Very strong. So the bishop is the, is, is the first priesthood, and he has the chief office. In other words, in plain language, he's the boss. Not a nice word to use for spiritual matters, but he's the boss. Now, there was a theory, you see, that the church was operated. The authority of the church rested in a group of priests. There's nothing in the scripture. There's nothing in the earliest traditions of the church to give any indication of this arrangement. It's always the bishop. And that is why the Second Vatican Council, which as I just said, restudied and rediscussed and redefined the function and role of the bishop could write, and I quote now, this sacred synod, that is the Second Vatican Council, teaches and declares that Jesus Christ, the eternal shepherd, established his holy church by sending forth the apostles as he himself had been sent by the Father. You remember his words, as the Father sent me, I send you, and he breathed on them as though he was, was, was imposing and infusing them with his very being. As he himself has, has was sent by the Father, he willed, Jesus willed, that their successors, that is, the successors of the apostles, namely the bishops, should be shepherds in his church even to the consummation of the world. So that's the authority of the bishops. By the will of Christ, he transferred his authority and his priestly power to the bishops to rule the church of God as St. Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus as we quoted earlier. Now, the word bishop, which means, by the way, guardian or overseer, is used in the New Testament five times. Once it is referred to Christ, who is called the bishop of our souls. St. Paul, in writing to the Philippians, greets those at Philippi, quote, with their bishops. Isn't that interesting? Now, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, refers to the whole flock which the Holy Spirit placed in the charge of the bishops. Well, my dear friends, rather than get into this more deeply, just about time for our mid-talk break. We're going to have another hymn by our St. Lucy's Choir, then I will be back to continue this study.
My dear friends, again, we thank our choir for being with us on our program. Uh, as I was saying, as we began, uh, as we talked in the first section, uh, I said that uh, the office of the bishop can be very frightening because it's one of great responsibility and great authority. We've just begun to indicate from the early testimony of the witnesses of, the, of men who knew the apostles and who wrote about the teaching of the apostles that the chief authority in the diocese is the bishop. He is the supreme authority in the diocese. For example, we read again in the, what, the, what the council says. Um, if I can find it here again. Said, yes. Well, first of all, St. Clement of Rome, he was one of the first popes after Linus and Cletus, um, makes it very clear that the bishop has the chief place in the office that goes back to the time of the apostles and that he is the sole authority within his diocese unless he delegates that authority to someone else. And that is why the council, reviewing, as I said before, the office and the authority of the bishop writes, this sacred synod teaches and declares that Jesus Christ, the eternal shepherd, sent by the Father, sent in his turn his successors, namely the bishops, to rule the church of God. Listen to what uh, St. Cyprian, one of the early writers, writes about the office of bishop. This is very important. I'm going to put it in plain language, I hope, after all. The church, holy one, is not divided up into sections, but forms one whole which, of which the unison of the bishops is the subject. And listen to what, listen to what this man says. Tertullian, writing about the same time, says, there is one single bishop, he's the only authority in his own diocese, there is one single bishop assisted by priests and deacons as a feature without which, listen to this, the name church is not applied. And there again, another early Christian writer writes, uh, 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 the Bishop of Antioch, one of the first bishops there writes, and he says, there is really only one flesh of the Lord, one Eucharist, in other words, only one cup, one Eucharist, to unite us in his blood, only one altar, that means we are community, as there is only one bishop. Now, what does that mean practically? Well, to put it on the bottom line, and I wish that someone else could say this, but I'll have to teach the truth. If you're a Catholic, and I'm sure most of you are, your authenticity as a Catholic does not depend upon your union with your parish or your membership in your parish. Oh, it's important because, you see, the parish, the council says, is a cell a part of the diocese. Your pastor is my agent in the Diocese of Humber Thibodeau. Uh, in New Orleans, the pastor is the agent of Archbishop Schulte because we can't take care of all the people ourselves. But one's authenticity as a Catholic depends, therefore, not only on one's membership in the parish, but one's membership in the diocese in which you live. And your authenticity, full authenticity as a Catholic, does not depend upon your union with your pastor, though this is important, but upon your union with your bishop, wherever you live. That is the pledge of your authenticity as a Catholic. If you are, in a sense, out with your bishop, you're really out with the church. Well, I don't mean you have to, you can disagree, you, you, that you, uh, you cannot disagree with something he says provided it's not clear teaching of the church. But if you really break, or even if suppose a priest were to start a parish of his own and say, I'm no longer under the authority of bishop so-and-so, it would not be a Catholic parish. In no way. You've got to be in union with the bishop. That's clear. Well, uh, that's the conclusion of all that I've said so far in this talk. The bishop is the chief priesthood of the diocese. All other priests get their priesthood from him. They're truly priests, but they share in the bishop's priesthood as the bishop shares in the priesthood of Christ. 
and as the people share in the priesthood of the bishop and their pastor as a authorized to worship God in the Eucharistic celebration primarily. Now, what are the duties of the bishop? What would you guess would be his most important function as bishop? This may surprise you. It's not confirming people. It's not really ordaining young men to the priesthood or older men to the priesthood, though that's important. And only the bishop can do this, by the way. It's not uh, keeping uh, good financial records, though he has responsibility to see that these records are also kept. It's not uh, going to uh, graduations or giving benedictions at banquets. The council makes it very clear. One, the eminent and the principal mission and duty of the bishop is to preach the gospel. And that's why I'm here. Nothing else could make me come and tape these talks in spite of my other duties, except that I know that whether they're good talks or bad talks, I'm doing the best that I can, and I'm preaching the gospel. And that's my chief duty. What's more, in matters of faith and morals, I speak in the name of Christ and of the church. That scares me. That's why I must be careful that what I preach is truly sound scriptural teaching of the church back by scripture and the tradition that goes back to that time. So that's my, the, the bishop's chief, func chief function is to preach. Now, secondly, important but not as important as preaching, he is the supreme uh, authority of the liturgy. There is no mass more significant in a diocese than when the priest and people See, like, for example, Holy Thursday. Or if the bishop goes to your parish, say, for a confirmation. There's no more important liturgy than the bishop, if he says Mass for the for confirmation, surrounded by the pastor and his assistant, if there's one, and the deacons of the parish and the people offers the liturgy. But the most frightening thing is, and I'm going to have to close with this because we're running out of time, the bishop is the chief authority in his diocese. He alone can make laws to which the people are bound to obey in conscience, and they don't like this, but it's true. For example, in the matter of the bingo, most people know that I made the right judgment. Some think I'm wrong. They're still bound to obey. Now, if they don't obey me, I'm not going to excommunicate them. But they will have to answer to God, not to me. So he makes the laws. He passes judgment. He's the final. Now, what he does most of the time does this to what we call the church court. But he appoints a judicial vicar, someone who takes his uh, place, because it's a lot of detail. We have an excellent judicial victor, vicar in our diocese in Goodman Senior Connicks. And the third thing, he is the chief liturgist. He regulates everything that pertains to the, to the liturgy, whether it's the Eucharist or confirmation or any, any service of what, whatsoever. The bishop is the final authority, just as he is the chief liturgist. Now, we've talked about the priesthood. Maybe it's profound, but I hope that I've left you, my dear friend, with some basic idea that the priesthood of Jesus Christ is shared, first of all, by the bishop as the supreme priest of his diocese, secondly, by the priests who are truly priests but are agents of the bishop and work under his authority, and finally, the people who, by their baptism and confirmation, or a priestly people, as St. Peter calls, and therefore are entitled to take part in the lit liturgy to worship God in an official role and not as strangers. Now, I wish I had more time to talk about vocations to the priesthood, but I'll make that a subject of a talk in the future. But in the meantime, I beg you, my dear people, to pray that we have more vocations to the priesthood. There's no reason why our good Cajun boys, they're great priests, that many of them should not be priests. Encourage them by your words. Pray for them, because Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest, that they send laborers into the harvest. And pray for your priests and bishops, that they may have God's grace to fulfill conscientiously and to your good the heavy responsibilities of their office. Until ne next week then, God bless and keep you.
My dear friends in Christ, welcome to our weekly program on this station, The Lord Among Us. Join us, please, each week. We uh, talk about our relationship with God. We speak of the Gospels, the epistles of the, uh, of the uh, various uh, writers, of our relationship with God, with our neighbor and one another, and with the world about us. Today I'm going to talk about something that uh, you've heard a lot about lately, and we'll hear more and more about stewardship. Are we good stewards? But before I get into the subject, as is our custom, we'll have an opening hymn. And on this program, we are proud to again welcome the um, Joyful Hearts Choir of uh, Homer. Well, my dear friends, here I am back again, and I want to thank the Joyful Hearts Choir once again for their presence on our program and remind you, if you don't know it already, that they are members of, uh, of uh, Holy Rosary Parish in, in, in Homer, Louisiana. We're going to talk about stewardship. I'd like to begin this way. About 2,000 years ago, or almost that long, a man walked along the shores of the Sea of Galilee or climbed the hills of uh, Judea, and he preached from those hillsides, and he preached from the back of boats, and in his talk he talked about many things with which the people were familiar. He spoke about fish, and crops, and wheat, and the birds of the air, and the flowers of the field, and he spoke about men cleaning their nets, and women making bread, or sweeping the house looking for a lost coin, or a shepherd looking for a lost sheep. 
He used those examples to, to teach his, his message. His name, of course, was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the promised Messiah of the ages. And he liked to preach also by telling stories, or we call parables today. And once he told the story about a fig tree, and in summary, this is the story, and I know you're familiar with it. It seemed that this landowner came in to check on the fig tree he had planted some years before. And when he got there, he saw it was the season of figs, and he, the tree had no figs. So he called the gardener and said, look, I've come here now for three years, and this tree is never born, so let's dig it up and throw it away. But the gardener said to him, sir, if you don't mind, uh, let me prune the tree and let me fertilize it. And if next year it does not bear fruit, then we can dig it up. The landowner agreed. Now this is one of the many parables that our scripture scholars say are stewardship parables. And by this they mean that uh, in, the, in, the, in the story of the fig tree, Jesus is teaching us that we owe to God the landowner who gave us life, who, who fed us as the tree was fed, who planted us on the earth, so to speak, that we are bound to give back to him a certain share of our fruit, which is, when we refer to humans, we speak of time, talent, and treasure. It's a stewardship program. By stewardship, we mean someone who is in charge of a household or somebody else's property. And God put us, he gave us dominion over the earth, and we are accountable to him how we care for these things and what we give back to him from what he has given us. Like the fig tree had to give back, otherwise it was going to be dug up. He told another parable, which is a stewardship parable, and it's a, a very important rich man was going to take a journey, so he called three of his servants in. He gave one ten talents, which was a coin, a rather, a rather valuable coin. He gave another one five, another one one. He said, now, I'll be gone for a while, but when I come back, I want you to do something with this and give me some additional money or some additional profit. So he went off, and after a long time, he came back, and he called in the man to whom he gave the ten talents. And I know you know this, but I, I want to tell it again. And he said to him, well, how did you do? He said, well, you gave me ten talents, sir, the steward said, the, the, the man said, the servant. I'm happy to tell you I have gained other ten talents for you. Well, the man was very pleased. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. I will now put you over even greater responsibilities. He called in the second man. He had given him five talents. The man came and said, sir, he said, you gave me five talents. I'm happy to tell you I've gained other five for you. Well, the, the man was very pleased again. The owner, he said, well, you're a very good steward. I'm going to give you even greater responsibilities in the future. Then he called in the man who had the one talent. The man said, sir, he said, you know, you gave me one talent, and I know you're a tough man, and I was afraid that if I made a mistake, I, I might lose even that, so I, I put it in the ground, hid it in the ground, so I could give it back to you when you came. Well, the man was furious. He said, you stupid fool. Not quite that way, I don't think, but he said, what a dumb thing to do. Why didn't you at least put it in the bank? I would have gotten some interest. So he took the talent from him and took away all the responsibilities. Well, that's a stewardship parable. God has given each of us talents. He wants us to use those talents for his glory and the good of others. In other words, he wants us to bring some profit back from what he has given us. Now, we don't have all the same talents. Some of us have ten, some have five, some have one. But all of us can do something for the gospel. All of us can use whatever talent we have in some little way, maybe to help some poor person, maybe to visit the sick, to do something required of the gospel. And not, not all of us are very rich, some of us are poor, but God expects a little something for the church support. You remember the in the, in the, in the, in the synagogue, and one day Jesus was watching the people put money into the treasury, and the wealthy came and they put a large amount of money and looked around to make sure they were being seen. And this poor widow came. She put in a small coin, which was really most of what she had. And Jesus turned to his people and said, you see that widow? 
She gave more with that small coin than all the rest put together. But she gave because she gave most of what she had. We're all stewards of what God has given us. We all have to do something, even if it's a little. But each one according to his means. And there are other such parables. There's the parable of the vineyard. When the man leases the vineyard to his tenants, when the time comes for the harvest, he sends his servant to gather his share. We're familiar with sharecropping in Louisiana. People have the land, and to pay for the use of the land, they give the owner a certain amount, a certain amount of the crop. That's what this man wanted from those in his vineyard. Hmm. They beat the guy, sent him back. So he sent someone else, finally he sent his son. They killed the son, they said, well, if we kill the son, we'll be the heirs. So in the parable, Jesus said, what do you think the, the master will do with those tenants? And the answer from the crowd was, well, he will certainly teach, punish them very severely and give the vineyard to someone else. He said, you've answered rightly. Another, another stewardship parable. God has plant, planted us in the vineyard of his church, in the vineyard of the world, and express, uh, express us as good stewards to give back to the church, and which is for him, of our time, our talent, and of our money. You know, when I was a student many, many, many years ago in Paris, at the seminary there, where the bishop had sent me to learn French, because we never spoke it at home, uh, there was a communist uh, paper. At that time, communism was very, very strong in France. And the editor of that paper once wrote an editorial, which he said substantially, and I'm going to translate it as best I remember. He said, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a far more powerful weapon for the renovation of our society than is our communist view of the world. But it is we who will conquer you in the end. He said, of our uh, uh, free time and a part of our vacation, we devote to communist propaganda. We take part of our salary for the same purpose of propaganda. But you, he said, you give very little money and very little time to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. How, he said, do you expect people to believe in the all-empower, all-embracing power of this gospel if you do not spread it, if you do not support it, if you do not live it? But you, he said, and this may make you angry, you, he said, you are afraid to dirty your hands. I've always remembered that. Are we afraid to get down into the nitty-gritty of working with the church, of giving our just share of our financial in income? Are we, are, we, are we doing that? I don't know. There's a story of Max, a little poor boy. I've told this many times on this, uh, on this uh, program. Very, very poor boy, but he had some rich friends, and they all liked him. He was a very personable young man. One day, one of his rich little boyfriends said to him, Max, he said, uh, you need some new shoes. You ought to ask God to have some of your rich friends give you some new shoes. Well, Max said, uh, I've been asking, I've been asking him to, to ask him, to tell him. Well, <laughs> the little, other little boy said, well, Max, obviously they're not, they're not doing it. God's not telling them. Oh, he said, yes. God is telling them, but they're not listening. Is God telling you to be a good steward? And are you listening? Am I listening? Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let, it, let us hear the parables of the stewardship and respond positively. Well, we'll take now our mid-talk break and have another hymn from our Joyful Hearts Choir, then I'll be back to continue this talk in the second part of this program.
Well, my dear friends, again, we're grateful to the Joyful Hearts Choir for singing on our program. I'm going to continue now with the talk on stewardship. We saw in the first section of my talk how our blessed Lord, uh, in the various parables which he told as a teaching technique, uh, made it very clear that uh, some, some norm of stewardship was essential if our relationship with God uh, is to be proper and, 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 and correct. He never said, however, how much we should do, not clearly, either in time or talent or our money. But I think we have to admit that the principle of stewardship is clearly in these parables. I'll have more to say about that later on, because he did say more about the, about the amount, but I'll get to that later. So let's get to the question of the amount. The question of the amount that people, a people or a person should give back to God is very clear in the Old Testament, even from the days of, uh, of Moses. For example, in the, in the book of Leviticus, the 30th chapter, God imposed as an obligation through Moses on the people what we call tithing. That is, that 10% of whatever they had each year belonged to God. They were to bring it to the temple for the upkeep of the temple, for the, for the, for the priest, and for the works of charity of the church and other needs. And this is what uh, God said to them through Moses. You may check it, the book of Leviticus, chapter 30. I quote, all tithes of the land, that is every tenth part, all tithes of the land, whether in grain from the fields or in fruit from the trees, belong to the Lord as sacred to him. So one tenth of whatever grain they had from the fields, whatever fruit they had from the trees, was by right and by justice God's and was sacred to him. Now that's uh, going to make some of our consciences stir a little bit. That's not all. What about the flocks? What about the sheep? What about the, uh, the cattle? Listen. The tithes of the herd and the flock shall be determined as seeding to the Lord belonging to God as sacred. Every tenth animal as they are counted by the herdsman's rod. Every tenth animal, regardless of which one it was, that belonged to God. A sheep, a goat, um, uh, a cow belonged to God. Every tenth one. These are the commandments which the Lord God gave Moses on Mount Sinai for the Israelites. Now look, these are not the suggestions. These are the commandments that God gave Moses to tell the people. A tithing or 10% of their grain, of their fruit trees, of their cattle, of their, uh, and of, their, uh, of the sheep, and of all the herds that they had. Not as a favor, but as belonging to God in a sacred way. To be given to the priests of the temple at that time because that was the only distribution of charity as such for the upkeep of the temple, for the works of charity, and other matters of what we call today social justice. Now, at the beginning of the old time, at that beginning, people were very, very loyal to God. But like you and me, sometime in time we get loyal rather lax. And the time came before too long that the Israelites were forgetting about this tithing. There might have been a little greed there, too, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, they forgot about it. So now we go to the book of Malachi, a very, very strong statement from Malachi. Now, God speaks to the people through Malachi and is condemning them because they're not tithing. But listen to the harsh words and the, and the strong language. Surely, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. In other words, I didn't change my tithing law. I, the Lord, do not change. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Yet you say, how must we return? 
Now listen to this. Dare a man rob God? He's telling them they're robbing him. Oh, look at this. They're surprised. They said, yet you are robbing me. And they say, how do we rob you? In tithes and in offerings. You are indeed accursed. They were robbing God because they weren't giving him the portion that was sacred to him according to the law given to Moses for them. Why, why, dare a man rob God, but you're robbing me. He said, the whole nation robs me. All of you are robbing me. So this is the way he renews the commandment. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and try me in this. Give me a chance to prove that you will not suffer, he says. And, I shall, and shall I not pour down blessings upon you without measure? Strong language. Now just one little comment. What did Jesus think about tithing? Well, I'm going to quote what's in St. Luke's 11th chapter and in St. Matthew the 23rd about tithing. Now Jesus is scolding the Pharisees. You think at first that he's scolding them for tithing, but listen to what he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, because you pay tithes on mint and rue and every herb and disregard justice and the love of God. These are the things you ought to do, in other words, justice and uh, the love of God, while not leaving the others undone. That's not condemning them. He's telling them, keep on tithing, but be sure that you're just and be sure that you love. And he says the same thing in Matthew. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. These things you ought to have done, that is, have mercy and faith, while not leaving the others undone. My dear friend, I have much more to say about this, but I think we're running out of time. I want you to very seriously consider this talk on tithing. And I beg you to listen to me next week I'm going to conclude my talk on tithing and give more clear indications from the teachings of Jesus, but especially from the practice of the church, that we must, at least according to the modern concept, give back a goodly portion of our time, our talent to God, as sacred to him in, in the Christian religion as he was in that of the, of, of the revealed religion of Israel. But we'll talk about that next week. In the meantime, pray over this, think about it, and ask God to make you a good steward. Until next week, then, God bless you.